Good morning, everybody. Um, you're all very welcome to this webinar on dust. Um, the webinar should last for about half an hour. Um, this is an event as part of Construction Safety Week. Um, today is the focus on occupational health and with specific focus on dust and respiratory crystalline silica. Our speaker today is Kevin Williams. Kevin is the Respiratory Services Manager with Arco Safety. Arco are a member of uh, the Construction Industry Federation. Um, Kevin will talk to you and give you the benefit of his experience in dealing with uh, dust uh, and with specific focus on how to ensure that you're not overly exposed to RCS. We'll have a poll test now just to check that people can, can hear us and see us. So you'll see a, a block in front of your screen there at the moment. This is aimed at participants. If you could maybe click on, can you see it? Or well, if you can't see it, you can't see it, but can you hear us? Uh, uh, and can you see us? That's great. That's coming back very positive. We're, we're, I think we're good to go. Um, just to say to you, um, if you would like to ask questions, we're going to, we'll, we'll wait till the end of the presentation to give questions. And at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a little Q&A box. So you can write in your questions there and Kevin will address those questions towards the end of the presentation. So at this point, uh, I'll hand over to Kevin, um, who will take it through the presentation. As I said, it'll probably take half an hour um, and hold on, to those hold on to those questions until the end. Now over to you, Kevin. Okay, thank you very much, Dermot, and uh, welcome all to this presentation on managing respiratory protection in construction. Uh, as Dermot introduced, my name is Kevin Williams, uh, the Respiratory Services Manager for ARCO uh, Training and Consultancy. I've been working with respiratory protection for the last 20 years. And uh, finally, as, as an industry, we're looking at the health associated uh, with health and safety a lot more than we have done in the past. Recently, the European Commission has looked at the change in carcinogens and mutagens directive um, it's identified 13 cancer-causing chemicals in the workplace. Um, by reducing the exposure levels of these 13 cancer-causing chemicals, the European Commission is looking to save over 100,000 lives over the next 50 years. Prevalent to the construction industry, silica is included in this list of 13, so it shows how important it is uh, to try and protect ourselves from that in the construction industry. Further reading information is contained in the OSHA Europe, uh, Europa uh, Labour Inspectors on Addressing Risks from Worker Exposure to Respirable Crystalline Silica, uh, and the link is there below for your further reading. So what is silica? Silica is found in most rocks, sand and clay, and in products such as bricks and concrete. When they are cut, sanded and carved, this dust may be fine enough to breathe deeply into your lungs and cause harm to your health. The fine dust is called respirable crystalline silica, or RCS as it's commonly known, and is too fine to see with normal lighting. There's three main ways that silica can harm uh, the body. First of all, by silicosis. Uh, that makes breathing more difficult and increases the risk of lung infections. Silicosis usually follows exposure to RCS over many years, but extremely high exposures can also lead to rapidly ill health. Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD, is a group of lung diseases, including bronchitis and emphysema, resulting in severe breathlessness, prolonged coughing, and chronic disability. It may be caused by breathing in any fine dusts, including RCS. It can be very disabling and is a leading cause of death. Uh, as with a lot of substances, cigarette smoking has been known to make this condition worse. Finally, lung cancer. Heavy and prolonged exposure to RCS can cause lung cancer. When someone already has silicosis, there is an increased risk of this. It doesn't take much uh, silica on a daily basis to, uh, to affect our respiratory system. So on this little uh, picture here, you may be able to see the 0.1 milligram, uh, which is your daily exposure to RCS. 
as you can see, that's not a, a vast amount. And it's quite imaginable that people could be inhaling that through the course of their activities in construction. Okay. Even by adequate controls, uh, reducing that amount can still cause adverse Ill, Ill effects. To show how the uh, silica can cause harm to the body, uh, a good training tool is always to use videos. This one's by WorkSafe uh, BC, and I'm just going to play that for you now. Silica. It's one of the most common substances on Earth. It can be found in materials like sand and rock and building products like concrete and brick. When a worker cuts, grinds, or drills materials that contain silica, dangerous crystalline silica dust is released into the air. <coughs> As the worker breathes, silica crystals flow into his mouth and nose and down the air passages deep into the lungs. The tiny crystals enter the small, fragile air sacs where oxygen is absorbed into the blood. Immune system cells, called macrophages, engulf and try to dissolve the crystals, but they are unable to. Over time, more and more crystals build up inside the macrophage cells. The macrophages carry the silica into the walls of the lung, where they die. Scar tissue forms around the dead cells and spreads as more cells die. This damage can continue even after the exposure to silica stops. Eventually, so much scar tissue forms that the lungs can no longer function. For information on how to protect yourself from silica exposure, visit WorkSafeBC.com. So as I mentioned, videos are a valuable tool for helping the end user, and that's who we need to really try and protect um, to understand the importance of the protection and control methods. Um, to help with risk reduction then is to have a good risk management process, and that's the usual look to identify the risk, assess the risk, control the risk, record and review, and then move back to identifying the risk if there's any changes in processes or materials. So to identify the risk, uh, this is a useful table to show what, uh, what contains silica. So you may or may not be surprised to know that in sandstone, 70 to 90% um, is made up of silica and concrete is 25 to 70%. And that moves all the way down to items such as marble with 2% of silica content. So a lot of these are used every day by all construction workers. Next is to assess the risk. Assessing the risk, we're gonna look at things such as duration, uh, work rate, and environment. So the longer the work takes place, um, there's a chance that there's gonna be an increase in concentration uh, of the, of the skill of the silica or construction dust present. Uh, similarly with the work rate, if we're working extremely hard and high intensity, there's a good chance we're gonna increase that concentration as well and things to the environment. So if it's a confined space um, or an enclosed area, again, higher concentrations are more than likely. So in assessing this risk, it's important um, when able to, to carry out some sort of personal monitoring or static monitoring, so we know how much construction dust is available, uh, is present. This isn't always um, likely because of the nature of the work. So in that case, we can look to local guidance documents and local enforcement agencies to give us uh, guided information on to uh, controlling that risk. Controlling the risk, we need to look at the hierarchy of control. And with regards to silica, we'd look at things like reducing the course and the emission, reducing the exposure, and also personal protective equipment as a last resort. 
eliminating or reducing the course, we'd look to purchase things like pre-cut stones. So if we can avoid uh, equipment needing to be cut, uh, then we're obviously going to reduce the chance of uh, silica being present uh, during the process. Things like using hand tools rather than power tools will also help reduce the uh, exposure to construction dust from our activities. Reducing the emission at source, um, you may uh, be aware of things like on-tool extraction or water suppression. If using on-tool extraction, we need to make sure that's uh, sufficient for the tools that we're using, so it's capable of extraction, extracting the construction dust generated. And water suppression, uh, that's not just dampening down the product that you're going to be uh, working with, it's making sure there's enough water to see the job uh, out to, to the end and making sure uh, the construction dust is kept to the minimum. Reducing the exposure, we'd look at things like work practices. So that would be isolation enclosure. If we can put up screenings to prevent others being in contact with the RCS um, and reducing others uh, to, uh, to be in contact, that, that's, that, that's what we should be looking for. Other things like extraction, be it local uh, exhaust ventilation, and things like housekeeping. So we should try and prevent uh, dry sweeping when we're doing our housekeeping. If we can dampen down the product uh, before sweeping up to uh, keep the dust at a minimum, or preferably try and use a hoover uh, to help prevent the construction dust. Finally, PPE would be a last resort in protecting the individual from uh, RCS and construction dust. Synthetic coveralls will prevent the generation um, when uh, the coveralls are being taken off, etc. And respiratory protective equipment, as long as it's in a detailed respiratory management program, will help the wearer be, uh, wearer's protection. To be a comprehensive management program, we need to look at four areas in respiratory protective equipment, and that's the selection is correct, uh, adequate training, maintenance of that equipment and also face fit testing however a combination of all the above controls is most likely needed to keep the workers exposure below unsafe levels so respiratory selection we need to first of all make sure that it's adequate and suitable by adequate we mean that the respiratory protective equipment is able to protect against the hazard that's present it needs to be suitable so it's uh, fit for purpose on the individual that's wearing that. The main things that we need to be aware of is what is the hazard and what is the concentration. We've talked about that briefly already, um, but you'll be surprised in most industries how many people do not know what the concentrations they're dealing with. Uh, but that's essential in selecting the correct respiratory equipment. Other things which are less uh, looked into um, in selecting respiratory equipment are things like the task, the time, the environment and the people. The task similarly to the risk controls is if it's a, a, a heavy work rate then a negative pressure tight fitting mask could be uncomfortable for the for the wearer. Similar with time, if they're going to be wearing that for eight hours a day, um, a filter respirator could be very uncomfortable. In both those scenarios, it could be worth looking at a powered respirator, which decreases breather's resistance, provides the word with a flow of air, and you can also incorporate uh, head protection, eye protection, ear protection in some of these units. Environments, again, if it's hot, if it's cold, can affect the selection of the respiratory equipment. And finally, and this is a, a new addition, uh, crazily to uh, the selection, is the people concerned. If the people will not wear the respirator equipment, then it, you, you, it, the, the whole selection piece has failed. So we need to look at things like face shapes, sizes, um, uh, uh, any health effects. You know, uh, do we suffer from asthma? Any uh, allergies uh, on the skin to any materials on the respiratory equipment? So they should always be included in the selection process. A sufficient respiratory training program would then need to be carried out and all people involved in the wearing, storage and maintenance should be trained. This training program, it shouldn't just cover um, this is a mask, this is how to wear it. 
It should be more detailed. It should include why is respiratory protective equipment needed? What are the hazards, risks, and effects of exposure? Why is it being provided? And how does it work? Uh, some of that can be used, such as the use of the video I showed you before on the silicosis. Um, these are all good training aids to the end user because that's who we want to protect and that's who we want to make sure is wearing their respirators going forward. How do you wear and check it correctly? Fit checking before use. What maintenance is required and when? And where and how do you clean and store it? Once you have a respirator, if it's not a disposable, um, it will require some sort of routine maintenance. Routine maintenance will be daily checks, checking such things as the seal of the respirator, the harnesses, the inhalation valves, the exhalation valves, making sure it's functioning properly and carrying out daily fit checks, normally by putting a hand over the filter and making sure it creates a vacuum uh, to the face. Some manufacturers on their equipment will also have, also have specific uh, specifications, such as annual servicing. These are often uh, missed in, uh, in a maintenance program, but they're required to make sure uh, a respirator achieves maximum performance throughout its duration. A lot of these things need to be like inhalation valves, exhalation valves, harnesses need to be replaced on an annual basis to ensure the equipment works properly. In most cases, um, the maintenance and the inspections will also need to be recorded on a monthly basis. Um, this is just a good practice to make sure that the equipment is being inspected properly and it's a good audit tool as well. The final thing on the respiratory program is face fit testing. So what is a face fit test? It's a method for checking that a tight fitting face piece matches a person's facial features and it seals adequately. It ensures incorrectly fitting face pieces are not selected for use. Performance of tight fitting RP depends on a good seal. This means no facial hair. With facial hair, that also includes stubble. Recent guidance has suggested that uh, no facial hair means a, a wet clean shave no more than eight hours prior to the start of a shift. One particular make or size is unlikely to fit everyone and should be done on the initial selection of RPA. So is face fit testing really required? Unfortunately yes because of the, um, the evidence and the seriousness of uh, lung disease in, in, in occupations, um, it's, it's evident that a lot of people are just not wearing masks correctly. So on this little picture here, you may be able to see there's a big gap there in the nose piece and an even larger one underneath the, um, the chin of, of, of the respirator. And this is all too common um, we, we come across in industry and particularly with females uh, in the industry. A lot of these masks and respirators are designed for men and they're just far too big uh, for females. Further information on that can be found in the HSC documents 28228 and also in the BSE N529 respiratory protective devices document. I'm a great believer in modern uh, training aids. So this is a video from the 1930s. It, uh, it serves a, per a, a dual purpose. Firstly, it shows that silicosis is not a new thing. It's been out, uh, known and uh, uh, trying to protect against for a long period of time. But it also shows the size of particulate um, that we need to protect ourselves against and why it can bypass stubble and facial hair. <laughs> This is the story of silicosis, a disease of the lungs caused by breathing fine particles of dust containing silica, granite dust. Its small particles consist mainly of free silica. The smaller the particles, the greater the danger to human lungs. Here is a fine mesh screen with over 100,000 openings to the square inch. Notice how readily the silica dust passes through. Yet this screen is so fine that it holds water.
Every drop poured into the sieve is poured back into the glass. Here is a typical American workman, one of the... Okay, I'll just end it there, but hopefully you saw the uh, silica coming through that, uh, um, that sieve, and that was 100,000 openings per square inch, and you can see the silica dropping through that, um, but it was so fine it could hold the water. So we're talking really, really small, so small amounts of RCS which can get into our system. So who should be face fit tested? It should be existing users of tight fitting RPE, and also on the initial selection of any new tight fitting RPE. A tight fitting face piece um, includes filtering face pieces, which are commonly known as disposables, and they come in an FFP1, FFP2, and an FFP3. Uh, for those familiar with assigned protection factors, that will offer an assigned protection factor of 4, 10, or 20. And that means how much cleaner the air is going to be inside the respirator compared to outside. It also includes half masks because they also rely on a tight seal around the face, the nose and chin. Full face masks, and that includes power assisted uh, line and also positive pressure apparatus, which the fire brigade would use, um, also needs a face fit test as it is a tight fitting and relies on a seal around the face. Loose fitting face pieces are the only items of respiratory equipment which are uh, um, not required and excluded. So that includes visors, head tops, helmets, loose fitting hoods. Um, so you're relying on a power source to give you your respiratory protection as opposed to breathing through a filter. Um, these don't rely on a tight fitting seal and therefore are the only suitable piece of respiratory equipment for people with facial hair. Obviously, there's cost implications in that. Um, an average powered respirator could be uh, in the region of six to eight hundred pounds, depending on the head top, compared to uh, three pound fifty to five pounds for an FFP3 disposable mask. There's two types of face fit testing. We have qualitative, commonly known as the bag over the head or the taste test, and quantitative, uh, which uses a machine called a port count. Qualitative, we would use a bitter or a sweet solution. We carry out a number of exercises and we spray that solution inside the hood whilst the individual is wearing the mask. If at any point during the exercises a taste is detected by the wearer, then it seemed that the mask does not fit. If no taste is detected, then the mask is a pass and it is assumed that a fit factor of 100 has been achieved. A downside to this method is it's subjective. We rely on the individual being tested to tell us whether that mask fits. A couple of scenarios are if an individual doesn't want to carry out a particular task, they could lie and say that they feel a leak when uh, it, it is fitting them. Uh, the worst scenario though is if an individual has just got a new, brand new job, um, they've been out of work for a period of time, they have an induction, they can taste the leak in the respirator, but they don't want to upset the apple cart. So they say that it does fit. Um, and those are the ones that, and it is common, and those are the ones that we do want to try and protect. This method can be used for FFP1, P2, and P3 disposables, and also half masks. So anything relying on a tight fit around the nose and chin. This method cannot be used for full face masks. The quantitative method can be used for the full range, FFP1, P2, P3, reusable half masks and full face masks. This is the only method that can be used for full face masks. This method involves a couple of sample tubes into a particle counting machine, uh, which is linked to a laptop. You have one probe in the atmosphere counting particles in the atmosphere and another one through an adapter into the respirator. As the individual carries out several exercises, um, the machine counts any leakage in the seal of the respirator. If, the, is, uh, uh, if there's a, a fit factor obtained, it would be 100 for half masks and 2000 for full face masks. This relies on a particle counter, so this method is not subjective um, 
and is the reason why it's used for full face masks because generally we're looking at higher levels of concentrations and we want to remove that subjectivity from this test process. The exercises are the same for all uh, the qualitative and quantitative fit test methods and they include normal breathing, deep breathing, moving the head from side to side, lifting the head up and down, talking out loud, bending over and back to normal breathing. If at any point the individual can taste the solution on the qualitative or it does not achieve the required pass level on the quantitative, it's deemed that that mask does not fit that individual. And we need to look uh, at another respirator um, to, to, to protect them in their work. So a fit factor is a measure of how well a particular face piece seals against the wearer's face. The higher the fit factor, the better the seal. Some respirators will offer a higher fit factor than others but this is not to be confused with the assigned protection factor of a respirator. Some concerns around uh, face fit testing and respiratory in general are the, uh, from a recent survey where the HSC estimated 50% of respiratory protective equipment does not offer the correct level of protection. It has not been correctly selected and users have not been adequately trained and face fit tested if applicable. Reasons for this are the respiratory is just not used. So it's been selected, people have been trained up on that, um, but the wearers are just not using it or using it correctly. The respirators might not be fitted correctly. And the face fit testing of tight fitting face pieces has not been carried out by a competent person. That brings me to um, an organization, the British Safety Industry Federation, and this is a useful website to get more information on face fit testing. The website is www.fittofit.org. And this gives lots of information on face fit testing and talks about a competency scheme for face fit testers. And it links in with 14 points of competency in the 282-28. And there's a concern that a lot of people, and unfortunately in the construction industry, are not carrying out adequate face fit testing to the point of, uh, for the qualitative, rather than conducting all the exercises, they may just be putting the hood over the, um, the individual, spraying a couple of times and uh, just saying, yeah, that's, that's good to go. But they're not conducting the full minutes exercises for all of the, uh, for, for all of the tests. Again, here's another modern video. Um, again, it's to show you that the face with testing is not new. Oh, it comes up. It's a link to YouTube, so it always catches me out this one. It doesn't look like it wants to play. I'm sorry about that. Um, again, I can provide a link to this video, but if you put FaceFit Test 1930s into YouTube, it'll come up with this video and the picture probably suggests what might happen uh, from a face fit test that long ago. Okay, and finally, after we've done all of this uh, risk control and uh, selected the correct respirators, we need to make sure that we do record all of our findings and periodically review. Okay, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for attending this webinar. Um, at this point, I'm more than happy to take any uh, questions and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kevin. Uh, very useful information there. Um, RCS and silica as, as uh, Kevin mentioned is going to be one of those issues that is really going to challenge the construction industry into the future. My own thoughts of this, the RCS is the new smoking ban and in, in, in the next couple of years we'll reach the point that we won't, it will be socially unacceptable that dust of that nature is, um, is released into the, into the environment. So at this point I'm just going to close out. Um, we have a couple of questions maybe 
uh, one there in relation to will it be able will it be able be available to download as in this video? Yes, it'll be available uh, later on today. Uh, and we have another question there. One of the main issues that I have uh, that I have is getting persons to save to shave their beards. They do not want and refuse any ideas to get around this. Maybe we might go back to Kevin on that one because I know Kevin has had a lot of experience in dealing with um, doing presentations to groups in relation to the wearing of uh, personal protective equipment. Um, I made the comment here to my colleague just as Kevin was making that point that uh, guys in the construction industry don't tend to shave every morning so it is a challenge. So I'm just wondering, is Kevin there? Maybe Kevin, you could take that one? Yes, certainly, Dermot. Um, the, you, you're not going to be surprised to know this is the most common question that we, we get asked in any presentation we do and in our uh, vocation as a face fit tester. I, I do sympathize with everyone concerned on this. Um, it, it's very difficult. Sometimes I have the easiest job to insist people are clean shaven when I'm carrying out a test. However, um, a company needs to ensure that's the case going forward. There's two methods you can use. It's either the carrot or the stick. Uh, education is huge. We want to, we don't want to beat anybody up, but we want to show them through training aids, through videos, possibly through external companies, um, what, what effects that uh, in, inhaling dust can do and why it can bypass our, our facial hairs. But we do get the odd, uh, it's a religious reason, it's a human rights reason why I don't have to shave. But as a company, we still have to protect them. Okay, um, we do have companies now writing into the initial contracts that people need to be clean shaven to, to work there. Um, it's not always simple to say a powered respirator is the, the only option because that could increase the, um, the risk of um, the, the risks involved in construction because that could restrict your vision uh, there's going to be traffic knocking around there's going to be um, tools um, uh, being used so it, it really is a difficult one all, all I can really say is it's, it's imperative that people are clean shaven when they're wearing that tight fitting respirator um, but it's, it's, it's that carrot and stick scenario. More than happy to take any phone calls uh, or offer, offer guidance on that going forward. But uh, you, you say not alone, Maria, and uh, I, I do feel for you. <laughs> okay. Okay, thanks very much for that, Kevin. Uh, uh, that, I think, concludes all our questions. Just to maybe to, to have a little bit more information in relation to download, the video will be, the video version of this will be available on the CIF YouTube channel. So if anybody wants to use it as part of the toolbox talk, please do. Um, at this point, I'd just like to thank, every, thank Kevin um, from ARCO on everybody's behalf. Um, but also we, we'll have a poll um, which should be available. If you could maybe give us a little bit of feedback, those who attended in relation to your experience of the webinar today. Also, just to remind you that um, Construction Safety Week continues this Thursday and Friday. Tomorrow we have continue on the health issue and its occupation, its mental health and positive mental health. And Friday then is driving for work. Um, so at, the, at, this, at this point, once again, I'll thank, thank Kevin and we'll sign off. And thank, thank you very much.